When Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis wrote Ghostbusters, they probably expected that they were writing something good. At least, I hope so, otherwise I'm not sure why they'd have bothered. But they could not have foreseen exactly how successful it would be. It was envisioned as a one-and-done project, as evidenced by the fact that the film had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Simpler times. But then, audiences responded positively not only to the film itself, but to the idea of a larger franchise. Ghostbusters wasn't just a movie that earned ten times its budget at the box office and even more through home video sales, but it found success in completely unexpected expected areas as well, such as animation, toy lines, and even fruit punch. The film's theme song even stayed in regular radio rotation for years, and it's taking every ounce of restraint I can muster to not start singing it to you. All of which is to say that Ghostbusters was so good that it created demand for more. That demand was met with a sequel, which isn't as good but is far better than anything else you'll hear about on this list, as well as an eventual reboot, a reboot that ignores the previous reboot, and of course, video games. Lots and lots of video games. Far more video games, admittedly, than should even exist in a just world. And it is our sacred duty to rank all of them from worst to best. I'll tell you up front that the worst the first end of this list is far heavier than the best. In fact, if this Twinkie represented the sheer awfulness of Ghostbusters games, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long and weighing approximately 600 pounds. It's a big Twinkie. But why is that? Well, Ghostbusters is a damn good film, but it's good in ways that don't often translate into games. It's sharply written, it's character driven, and it relies on the natural humour generated from the interplay between these specific characters. If you get rid of all that, turn Bill Murray into a faceless character sprite, and slap him into the pre-existing frameworks of other games, you'll start to see the problem. Even so, we will rank every officially released Ghostbusters game from worst to best, based largely on how easily the games reduced us to angry, frustrated tears. We will not count any of the handheld LCD games, pinball games or mobile games, however, because a man has his dignity. Let's rank him. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. I mean, I'm Ben. I'm Ben. Slip of the tongue. I'm afraid of all ghosts, actually. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is every Ghostbusters game ranked from worst to best. Number 20. Extreme Ghostbusters 2001 Game Boy Color. Extreme Ghostbusters for the Game Boy Color is quite clearly a punishment for some misdeed I committed in a past life. I just wish I knew what it were so I could atone for it and never have to suffer through this again. Every aspect of the game feels like a parody, from the nausea-inducing snapping of the camera to the fact that aiming your proton beam downwards makes it look like you're uh, urinating. The levels provide little indication of where to go, and the controls provide little assistance in getting there, often feeling like you're controlling the arthritis that's slowly progressing through your character's body. You move so sluggish that the developers must have been hoping you'd die before being in a position to review it, and levels don't end so much as they just stop, as though they can't believe anyone bothered to complete them. They also attempted to draw Egon on the mission introduction screen, but started drawing his body in the wrong place. Rather than redraw it, they just crammed his head down so that he looks like Quasimodo. There are several different playable characters, each of whom exists just to turn what fresh hell is this into a multiple choice question. The game also doesn't look great, but neither did the actual Extreme Ghostbusters cartoons, so maybe that's just a mark of fidelity to the source material. Really, the main problem is the sense of tedium, which somehow sets in long before you even manage to fit the cartridge into your Game Boy. I didn't play this game to the end, nobody did, nobody ever will. But I'm guessing the end screen consists of half of Egon's eyeball, the word congratulation, and then the game explodes and kills you. Number 19. Ghostbusters 2, 1992. Atari 2600. Please indulge me for a moment. This was released in 1992. To say that this was past the heyday of the Atari 2600 is putting it lightly. This was past the day the system was dead, buried, and its widow remarried. 1992 wasn't just long after the NES supplanted it in every home that cared about video games, but it was also after the SNES had supplanted that. Why? Activision would release Ghostbusters 2 on the Atari 2600 
100 is beyond me. Actually, it was beyond Activision as well. They developed the game, cradled their heads in their hands and screamed, what have we done, into the silence of an uncaring universe. Salu Limited scooped it up to release only in Europe, where they knew would be too polite to object. There are only two levels, and somehow they both managed to be less fun than each other. The first sees you descending beneath New York to collect a slime sample, though you'd be forgiven for thinking we were showing you footage of a Lego spelunking game instead. The second, which you will never reach as long as you live, sees you controlling the Statue of Liberty's fist, which is only a few feet above the ground as though she's sliding along on her belly. Neither level looks as difficult as it really is, with enemies and hazards often being unavoidable without several dozen strokes of luck in a row. Either the game was never playtested, or it was playtested extensively with the goal of being the hardest game ever that wasn't strictly impossible. It is technically a port of the Ghostbusters 2 game we'll discuss in a bit, which is still crap so don't get too excited, but this one really is by far the worst version. So I decided to bust this one down a few places. What can I say? Busting makes me feel good, I'm sorry, let's move on. Number 18. Extreme Ghostbusters Creativity Center 2001 PC were you a fan of Extreme Ghostbusters? Maybe, but you certainly weren't a fan for long. The show only spent about 12 weeks on the air before it was brought to the side of a creek and told about the rabbits. Were you a fan of printing programs? No! Nobody was, or is, or ever will be, but if you happen to be a fan of both, which you're not, let's be honest with each other, Extreme Ghostbusters Creativity Center is the game for you. Is it a stretch to call it a game? Yes. Then again, it was a stretch to charge money for this in the first place, so let's not split hairs. Its main draw was, well, let me turn it over to the press release, the ability to create greeting cards, door signs, bracelets, calling cards, name tags for school, etc. Right, so it had no main draw then. Funnily enough, the press release feels embarrassed to even bring it up, burying it under similar titles from Inspector Gadget and Baby Felix the Cat. Of course, once you've wrung every ounce of fun that you can from putting Slimer on a JPEG in celebration of your nan's 90th birthday, there are many games to keep you occupied. And by that, I mean you'll be kept busy for a few minutes, trying to remember how to uninstall the software. The games consist of join the dots, match the cards, click the ghost, and snap the CD in half. I admit that I made that last one up but it was very fun. Number 17. Extreme Ghostbusters Zap the Ghosts 2001 PC Don't you just love it when games include complete walkthroughs in their own titles? If you remove the colon, it would double as a plot summary. Extreme Ghostbusters Zap the Ghosts is, let's not mince words, Puzzle Bobble, or bust a move if you want to declare independence about this. As in, that's all it is. It's not a similar game, or a unique game built around Puzzle Bobble's mechanics, it is Puzzle Bobble, but with all of the charm stripped out and some superficial extreme Ghostbusters art layered over the top of it. It honestly seems like a fan-made browser game that was whipped together in an afternoon. Obviously, I am aware that game development is never as easy as it looks, though, and with tie-in games, it's very likely that the developers were given an extremely tight deadline in order to get the product on shelves quickly enough to take advantage of fan interest. It's likely that Light and Shadow Productions had to scramble to get something made in 2001. Wait, 2001? When did the show end? 1997! There was no rush at all! Nobody even remembered Extreme Ghostbusters at that point. What was the reason for making this? <sighs> Being Puzzle Bobble, because this is Puzzle Bobble, there is some enjoyment to be had here, especially if your main concerns with Puzzle Bobble were that it looked too nice, was too much fun to play, and had a soundtrack rather than some miscellaneous songs from a royalty-free music archive. There's an actual game at the core of Zap the Ghosts, and that alone, dear viewer, is enough to bump it depressingly high on this list. Number 16. Ghostbusters 2, 1989, Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Commodore 64, MSX, and ZX Spectrum. Some versions of this game certainly look better than others, but none of them end up being much fun. It's admirable that each level is unique, but ultimately they're all just different flavours of misery. In the first, you play as Ray Stance, descending towards a river of slime to collect samples. Along the way, he will have to find pieces of his equipment and assemble it, you'd think, perhaps that the Ghostbusters should have taken care of this back at the lab or at any other point before lowering their friend and colleague into a cavern full of ghosts, but I'm no scientist. As the first stage took place near the beginning of the film's events, it only makes sense that the second stage takes place at the very end. Here, you shoot ghosts while the Statue of Liberty ambles around. This in itself is fine, but you also have limited ammunition in the form of slime that the ghosts drop. To collect the slime, you need to move little people around to gather it up. They can easily be killed, and the slime disappears after a few seconds. Managing them and killing the ghosts is too much to focus on. 
It's sort of like trying to juggle while driving a school bus, which I was told in no uncertain terms was unacceptable and I could pick up my final paycheck at the end of the month. The third level is a boss fight against Vigo, even though you spend most of your time trying to keep a baby away from Peter McNichol. Once he's incapacitated, Vigo leaves his painting to stomp around like an upset toddler who's been told that they have video games at home and that this is the video game at home. Number 15. Ghostbusters 1984. Amstrad CPC, Atari 2600, Commodore 64, Master System, MSX, NES, and PC. In the 1980s, it seems like the more systems that got a game, the worse that game turned out to be. I wonder why that is. Actually, I don't. There are far bigger problems in the world than a bad Ghostbusters game from nearly 40 years ago. Still, we might as well talk about it while we've got a minute to do this entry. You know, you've got to pad it somehow, don't you? Most people will recognise this game in its notorious NES incarnation, but it was actually released for home computers years earlier, with its original version being considered the Commodore 64 one. This is absolutely a better game than what Nintendo fans got, but it's still not good. Some of the worst quirks of the NES game are not present here. There's no tedious stairway sequence and you don't need to keep dodging sleepy drivers on the road. But then again, the NES game lacks some of this version's features, such as the Keymaster and Gatekeeper, represented here as a key and a gate, which is a bit on the nose, but at least they weren't represented by, you know, actual genitalia. Or maybe they were, actually, I don't quite know. The graphics are very primitive. The NES game also added an irritating final boss fight and an appalling translation. Particularly odd, as the computer versions had perfectly good English text. So really, it's a case of pick your poison. Or don't, because they're all poison. If you must play Ghostbusters 1984, the Master System port is by far the best, taking elements from the previous versions and smoothing them out into something that actually resembles a game. Then again, it's still just the best version of an awful experience. You know, sort of like the best version of being punched in the eye. Number 14. Ghostbusters VR Now Hiring 2017 PlayStation 4 and PC Split into parts for the sole purpose of sucking far more money away from you than the game deserves, Ghostbusters VR is less a game and more an experience. Now that's alright, Star Wars and Batman have given us similar experiences in VR, but what you get here is more like a guided tour of somebody's collection of mint Ghostbusters action figures, in that it's all there, but you certainly aren't allowed to enjoy any of it. The entire point of VR is immersion, right? I mean, honest question, is there any point to creating a VR game in which you can barely interact with anything? Is there a reason to give you a proton pack in VR if nothing you shoot with it reacts in any way? The first chapter sees you walking around the firehouse while the voice of Patton Oswalt makes you wish the voice of Patton Oswalt would please shut up. The entire experience takes maybe six minutes, if you fall asleep. You grab your weapon, attempt to leave, and are confronted with a screen that invites you to pay for the rest of the gameplay, which may hopefully, indeed, have some actual gameplay. Spoiler warning, it does. Further spoiler warning, it's somehow even less fun than walking around and scratching your ass in the firehouse was. At least there, you could actually walk around. On the bright side though, if you suffer from motion sickness while wearing a VR headset, you'll get more out of this game. Vomiting on your carpet represents presents far more interactivity than most people will ever get out of the, quote, experience. Number 13. The Real Ghostbusters 1993 Game Boy This one is a bit of a ride, so buckle up. Kemco's Crazy Castle series is a maze of licensing and legal nightmares. The first game was created as a Who Framed Roger Rabbit tie-in, until it left Japan, at which point it became a Bugs Bunny game instead. The second and third games featured Mickey Mouse in Japan, but retained Bugs Bunny in the West. Except for Europe, which got Hugo in the third game as punishment for crimes we were destined to commit. The fourth game kept Mickey for Japan, but swapped out bugs in North America, this time for original character do not steal, Kid Clown. 
who himself would go on to helm his own series. Europe, still reeling from Hugo, was spared the assault. The fifth game, thankfully the last one about which I will ever be expected to speak, is the one on this list. It again kept Mickey in Japan, but gave Garfield to Europe and Peter Venkman to North America. So, that's six games, with seven protagonists released under 13 names. <laughs> I'm glad we're finished. Only we're not finished, because this game was actually stolen, almost detail for detail, from an Amiga game starring a character called P.P. Hammer. And I swear to God, if our writer is making all of this up, I'll... what? Well, do you know what, I'll just congratulate him actually, because this is brilliant stuff. For a time, it was assumed that Kemco simply bought the rights to the PP Hammer game and slapped new assets onto it, especially since that's been the modus operandi of the entire Crazy Castle kerfuffle. Instead, though, PP Hammer creator Gunner Leader, a name only slightly less marvellous than PP Hammer, confirmed that Kemco simply ripped him off without repercussions. So, that's the history lesson over. What about our review of this game? Well, it's fine. It doesn't make me regret my own birth, so it's therefore better than seven other games starring the Ghostbusters. Number 12. Extreme Ghostbusters The Ultimate Invasion 2004 PlayStation Wait, hang on. Another Extreme Ghostbusters game? From 2004? But a show that only ran for about three months continued getting games for seven years? How is that even possible? I mean, if you reach that point and want to make another Ghostbusters game, just make it a generic Ghostbusters game. Kids who liked the show in the first place would no longer even be kids by the time this came out. They'd be embarrassed they ever liked you in the first place, Extreme Ghostbusters. Okay. All right, I'm calm. I'm calm. Right, here we go. The Ultimate Invasion is technically a rail shooter, in the sense that a rail moves you briefly between static screens, where you stand for minutes on end shooting at ghosts that just pop up like targets at a carnival and throw bogeys at you. You shoot them, you wait, you shoot more of them, you wait, you wonder if it might be more fun to just hold your breath until your brain turns off, you shoot more of them, and if you're very lucky, a lightning storm fries your PlayStation before you do any of it again. This game is playable, but it's never any fun, and it certainly isn't any good. We've seen worse looking games, and it's a bit of a stretch to call it a historical atrocity, but that's the closest we can come to recommending it. On the bright side, Extreme Ghostbusters The Ultimate Invasion did at least do its vocabulary homework. Ultimate is often used to mean best or most impressive, but the word actually means final, and this was indeed the last of the Extreme Ghostbusters games. I can say with complete sincerity that I appreciate its honesty. Number 11. Ghostbusters 2 1990 NES Ghostbusters 2 for the NES received middling reviews, typically in the 50-60% to 60 range, but it's safe to say that even those scores are slightly too high. To be honest, the critics were probably just glad they didn't have to play yet another version of the previous Ghostbusters NES game. Ghostbusters 2 feels like half of an idea stretched to the length of a full retail release. There are some decent elements to be found, but not nearly enough of them and they aren't refined enough to be worth experiencing. The only stages most players are likely to even see consist of walking from right to left and driving in a straight line, both of which sound simple enough to be tedious, but which are actually difficult enough to be irritating. Ha <laughs> ha! What fun! No, really, what fun. The driving stages are overcluttered gauntlets with little space for reaction, and extremely picky jumps over instant kill pits. The walking stages are no easier either, with swarms of difficult to avoid enemies. They're sliming me, they're stunning me, and they're knocking me down with their ghost hands. Sorry, sorry about that. The point is, everything is too repetitive, too stiff, and too difficult to be enjoyable. It's also nowhere near fast-paced enough to be called a run and gun. I guess at best you could call it a shuffle and squirt. 
Actually, no, don't call it that. We'll get we'll get demonetized. Eventually, you'll get to play a shoot 'em up level as the Statue of Liberty. It looks different, but it's still not fun. On the bright side, there's a chip tune version of Jackie Wilson's Higher and Higher, which is both adorable and a welcome nod to the movie, which until this point had precious little to do with the action of the game. Make it to the end, which you won't, and you'll square off against Vigo the Carpathian. And by that, I mean a very brief cutscene plays of Vigo being treated to a celebratory slice of boo cake. <laughs> Happy New Year. Number 10. The Real Ghostbusters, 1987. Arcade. The animated Ghostbusters series had The Real added to the title so that nobody would confuse it with The Ghostbusters, a 1975 sitcom in which two of the guys from F Troop performed slapstick with a gorilla. Easy to confuse the two, I know. And yes, yes, I am aware that there was an animated version of that show as well, but that was rushed through production to take advantage of the success of the unrelated Ghostbusters film. Meaning, ironically, that this show not only might confuse children, but counted on doing so. They even changed the name to Ghostbusters without the space, creating the very confusion that the real Ghostbusters sought to avoid. Anyway, the real Ghostbusters, also known as the Gorillaless Ghostbusters, was a huge hit, expanding the burgeoning franchise to a whole new audience. And it was an audience that really, really loved tie-in video games. What a stroke of luck. It was actually a modification of Q Hunter G, I think, released earlier the same year. I don't know what Q Hunter G means, but after a few minutes of playing it, I'm pretty sure it translates to something like, haha, you wasted your pocket money. It's not a fun game, and the real Ghostbusters probably should have made many more improvements than it did, but at least it made some effort. It had extra levels, better weapons, smaller enemy swarms, and a few Ghostbusters-specific tweaks. It even offered three-player mode, allowing allowing friends to play as Doe, Ray, and Egon. There's just one thing they forgot to add, anything to enjoy whatsoever. You can certainly do worse, but 1987 had no shortage of better arcade experiences than this. That was the same year as Contra. Yes, that only supported two players, but would you rather play a game with one friend and enjoy yourself, or with two friends and wish a sinkhole would open up beneath the arcade and drop you straight into the Earth's core? Number 9. Extreme Ghostbusters Code Ecto-1 2002 Game Boy Advance can it be? A good Extreme Ghostbusters game? No! Sorry to have gotten your hopes up. It's the best Extreme Ghostbusters game, but it still pales in comparison to all the fun you can have sitting on a nail. At the very least, it looks fine. It's true to the visual spirit of the cartoon, so if you're a fan, it's worth playing for that alone. And that's good, because nothing else about this game is worth playing. You'd think that the easiest thing to get right in a portable 2D platformer is the camera, but Extreme Ghostbusters games seem dedicated to causing extreme nausea. How hard is it to just let the screen scroll smoothly as you advance? That was a hypothetical question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Super Mario Bros. managed it in 1985, so I imagine it's not very hard. That was almost 20 years before Code Ecto-1, so there's no excuse for the latter to give me kinetosis. The snappiness of the camera also doesn't mesh at all with the sluggishness of the actual platforming, making the entire experience feel like the worst of both already terrible worlds. There is a bit of variety to the missions, which is nice, as in the NES game, overhead driving sequences introduce each new location. Here, however, you'll have to collect clocks along the way, because as long as we're reminding players of the horrendous Ghostbusters NES game, we might as well remind them of the even worse Back to the Future NES game. Also, you can choose between two characters, allowing you to regret playing it twice as much. Number 8. Ghostbusters 2016 PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. Right, up front, let's all agree that there is very little that's more tedious than talking about the 2016 Ghostbusters film. I know, you hated it. I also hated it. Every living creature hated it, as did most of the dead ones, but it exists, and talking about it beyond that only invites the worst people on the internet into our comments section. Fortunately, we don't have to talk about it beyond that. The tie-in game has little to do with the film that it ties into. That's an odd choice, but it does allow us to evaluate the game on its own merits, and oh boy, does it not have many merits! It picks up where the film left off. Considering the world was more interested in being destroyed by a meteor, that's a bad start. The game is a tedious slog that involves shooting waves of identical enemies through levels that can take around 40 minutes each to complete. On the bright side, this gives you plenty of time to reflect upon the course your life has taken and consider ways to avoid making the same mistakes that led you to this point. On the less bright side, you're never getting your $50 back. The game was considered one of the worst things to come out of 2016, and if you remember 2016, that's saying something. It sunk developer Fireforge into a debt of 11 
$11.3 million and they shut their doors only three days after the game's release once it became clear that people would rather flush their money down the toilet than exchange it for a copy of Ghostbusters. On the bright side, the soundtrack is rather good. I wonder who did the music? Let me just check here. Grant Kirkhope. Oh, Grant. Between this and you signing up to compose Fur Fun, we have got to find you an agent. Number 7. Ghostbusters Sanctum of Slime 2011 PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC Fans of the 2009 Ghostbusters game will often wonder aloud why it never got a sequel, and their fellow bus passengers will shush them. They must have forgotten all about Sanctum of Slime. In fairness to them, it is pretty forgettable. It isn't a bad game, to be clear, but it's far from good. It's a relatively short and mindless twin-stick shooter that is best enjoyed in multiplayer, which is still a fun way to waste a few hours with AI companions. The story picks up after the events of the first game, but without the writing and vocal talents of the original actors, the entire experience does indeed feel like an afterthought rather than a continuation. One nice detail is that it rolls some aspects of Ghostbusters 2 into the experience. Fitting, since the previous games relied mostly on material from the first Ghostbusters film, but well, look at it. Any material from the films is going to feel superficial in an arcadey shooter like this. That isn't inherently a complaint, but it does mean that its target audience is less clear. Ghostbusters fans might be bored out of their mind with this, and people who don't care about Ghostbusters might find it to be a really enjoyable score attack. Its association with Ghostbusters basically comes down to some imagery and a license Atari wanted to squeeze just a little more cash out of. The biggest crime of Sanctum of Slime, and no, I'm not about to start rapping, is that it's forgettable. Not bad, not great great, just a competent shooter that was deserving of its budget price, but not much else. And the fact that it made it this far up the list solely for not being terrible is downright tragic, really. Number 6. Ghostbusters 2 1989 PC not to be confused with the game of the same name, released for the other computer systems the same year, the version of Ghostbusters 2 developed by Dynamics and released for MS-DOS is, well, not great, but it's surprisingly far from terrible. Look, with all of this mood slime around, I'm trying to be positive, alright. We will say that it did something no other game has successfully done. It made us feel like Spider-Man. Like a Ghostbuster, sorry. Force of habit. You follow the rough plot of Ghostbusters 2, but the bulk of the experience will consist of answering phone calls from people who have seen spooks, spectres, or ghosts, and then heading out to bust them. These stages are like shooting galleries, but fire indiscriminately and you'll destroy property and maybe even create some new ghosts, which will impact the amount of money you earn from the job. And money is important. You have experiments to conduct on the slime beneath the city and a Statue of Liberty to spray with it from the inside, which sounds far more obscene than I intended it to sound, and I am sorry. And that's clearly an NES controller on the screen, in an officially released DOS game. Did they pay for the rights to use that, or were they being cheeky? And yes, I know a controller was used in the film, but it wasn't a normal NES controller, it was an NES Advantage, so it's not as though Dynamics could fall back on saying, we made what we saw in the film. This is weird. Even weirder, the fact that the game is actually pretty darn fun. Number 5. Ghostbusters The Video Game 2009 DS the DS version of 2009's Ghostbusters game doesn't get spoken about nearly as often as the other two versions do, but you know what? It's not bad. Wisely, it's been completely redesigned to suit the DS rather than a scaled-down, inferior version of the others. It even has its own unique selling points, such as the fact that you play here as the original four Ghostbusters, whereas the console versions have you playing as a brand new recruit. It also adds unique vehicle sequences, which seem to exist as an apology for the NES games. They're still not great here, but, you know, they work, which sadly counts as progress. You'll visit many of the same locations as you do in the console versions, but each of the missions feels different. The top-down perspective with chatty NPCs lends a completely different feeling to the game, as does the rescuing of innocents along the way. And we don't just mean walking to a character and interacting. It's up to you to guide them to safety, which is rarely difficult, but which does make your actions feel at least a little bit like they matter. The game also has you managing the public perception of the Ghostbusters, which can be altered by completing optional objectives and side missions. It doesn't add as much depth as it probably should, but it's a welcome way to make this version of the game stand out. Overall, this title isn't great, and certainly the game only exists in DS form so they could pull in a little more money, but there was some admirable effort made here into turning this into a unique and worthwhile experience of its own. Number 4. Ghostbusters 2 1990 
Game Boy. It's not perfect, but I think we can all agree that the Game Boy version of Ghostbusters 2 is the most adorable thing mankind has ever produced. Seriously, look at this cutscene. Can you honestly tell me that you wouldn't watch the entire movie redone in this style? Don't lie to me, don't lie to yourself. The game is single player, but your team consists of two characters. And you know what that means? Terrible AI. Which is a shame, because that's the only true drawback that this game actually has. You mainly control one character, moving him around and firing proton streams at ghosts, while the other follows you like a child that you have to keep stopping from eating things he found on the street. Plus, you rely on this other character to toss out ghost traps, so you can't just ignore him, either. You need to make sure he's in the correct position and facing the correct direction, otherwise the ghost gets away. Oh, also, he can wander into enemies and get killed. Marvelous. And yet it's so far up the list. How can that be? Well, for two reasons. First, if there are mostly bad games in a series, some bad games are still going to end up high on the list, so don't go knotting your knickers over it, alright? But secondly, and I know I said this earlier, have you seen how cute it is? Aside from the dopey AI, it's a pretty fun hour or two of gameplay. Maybe not worth seeking out if you're not already interested in Ghostbusters games, but... Wait, you are actually interested in Ghostbusters games, right? I mean, if you're not, why did we even bother making this list for you? Jeez, I really need to get my priorities straight. Number three, new Ghostbusters 2, 1990 NES. We've already seen what poor, unfortunate Americans ended up playing when they picked up an NES cart that had Ghostbusters 2 written on it. Rumour has it, they're still scarred to this day. Actually, it's not even a rumour. Have you been watching the news lately? Right, anyway, the point is that in Japan, and two years later in Europe, fans got a Ghostbusters 2 game that was... It was fun, actually. What? Am I reading this right? As in, something that a reasonable human being could publicly admit to enjoying without having their sanity questioned? Oh boy! It had a good soundtrack and pleasing visuals, similar to what we just saw on the Game Boy, but in colour, which, by default, makes it more faithful to the original movie. Well, more faithful overall. For some reason, they made Winston blue, and I am uncomfortable with that decision in ways I'm not sure I can even express. To make up for the half Ernie Hudson, half Smurf hybrid, though, we do get a playable Rick Moranis, which in itself makes this an experience worth experiencing. It's a different game from the Game Boy version, but it's obviously very similar in terms of gameplay. It's quite a bit more refined, actually, with the playing area feeling less cramped, and the AI companion being marginally less unintelligent. I would have said marginally more intelligent, but I really don't want to oversell it. The levels even require a bit of exploration, and feature area-specific ghosts, such as this one that reaches out from the bathtub, which may or may not be intended to be this thing, reaching out from the bathtub. Basically, if you're in any piece of Ghostbusters media, you're probably safest if you just don't bathe. Number 2. Ghostbusters 1990 Mega Drive Ghostbusters for the Mega Drive often gets overlooked, both in discussions of licensed games and in discussions of Ghostbusters games. That, in a word, is utter silliness. Sorry, in two words. And pardon my harsh language, but it's true. The game is genuinely fun, and it answers the question I've been asking myself throughout this entire list. Why can nobody make a fun game in which you shoot at ghosts? Ghostbusters for the Mega Drive answers that with a resounding, hold my ecto cooler. The game is a perfectly good platformer with cartoonish horror sprinkled throughout. It's genuinely challenging, but rarely unfair. It has a memorable art style, a great soundtrack, solid boss fights, and a choice of three characters with different attributes, giving it a bit of replay value. Yes, that's only three characters. I guess Winston must have been on birthday party duty that day. The the game isn't perfect, I admit. There are some pretty nasty difficulty spikes for one, and though they are few, they may well eat through your continues. The character portraits look nice for the most part, except for Bill Murray's, which looks like somebody exhumed their uncle. 
It's also a bit short, clocking in at around two hours from tip to tail. But this all feels like nitpicking, really. For an early 16-bit game, and a licensed one at that, there's very little we could ask for that Ghostbusters doesn't deliver. It's cute, engaging, and actually fun. Even more fun, though, is the Ghostbusters Wiki's attempt to find a place for it in Ghostbusters canon. Fans are really interesting sometimes. It's just a good thing they didn't give Slimer blue arms. Or oh, heaven forbid. Number 1. Ghostbusters The Video Game 2009 PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PlayStation Portable, Wii, Xbox 360, and PC. Who would have thought that the best Ghostbusters game would be the one that involved the original writers, the full cast, story ideas from the scrapped third film, compositions and locations from the movie, and a wealth of lovingly recreated set pieces? Oh, everyone? Right. Like its title, Ghostbusters the video game can be split into two halves. As an interactive Ghostbusters product, it's sincerely the best thing that any fan could have hoped for. As a video game, however, it's a far from perfect experience. To focus on the positive, it really is a delight to simply inhabit this world, exploring areas we'd previously seen in the movies and unearthing easter eggs. Using the group's gadgets to take down familiar faces is great, and really hammers home a fantastic feeling of nostalgia. The voice performances are all varying degrees of good. Bill Murray was singled out as sounding a bit detached from the material, but he is still funny, and it is worth remembering that the man was 208 years old at the time of recording, so you know, go easy on him. As a game though, boy, we sure wish we were allowed to play it. Ghostbusters the video game suffers from severe hand-holding. Very rarely are you able to, you know, just be a Ghostbuster. In a sense, that works narratively. You are a rookie learning the ropes. But from the beginning of the game through to the end, you are told what to do, and then you do it. It feels less like a video game than it does an extremely cumbersome round of Simon Says. We were tempted briefly to split the game into two entries. The Wii, PlayStation 2, and PSP releases are often considered the stylized version, with the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC releases being the realistic version. As realistic as a game about middle-aged men shooting ghosts in hell can be. Anyway, the differences are mainly cosmetic, but there are tweaks to the levels and gameplay throughout. However, since both of them would have been at the absolute top of this list anyway, it felt silly to basically talk about the same game twice in succession. If you want to know which of the two versions to pick up, well, you are an adult, and I trust you to make that decision for yourself. However, the realistic version did get a remaster in 2019, so that one's probably easier to find, if that helps. Either way, though, it's tough to argue that any other Ghostbusters game is superior. Ghostbusters the video game doesn't hit all of the right notes, but it hits a lot of them, and it hits them well. Now let's just see how that new film turns out. Here's hoping it gets a terrible video game tie-in. The extreme Ghostbusters could use some company at the bottom of this list.